Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm here with Christian Lorenzen, who's a, a book reviewer and literary critic, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. in New York. And um, he's agreed to join me today to discuss the American historian Christopher Lash. Uh, uh, Christian has written a really nice essay called The Hopeful Dystopian in Jacobin. And um, I've asked him to just chat with us today about the the enigma of Christopher Lash. Um, I think that's the right word, um, because as we were just saying before we started, um, the guy the guy's misunderstood. And I think that Christian and I both kind of want to make a case that um, that maybe he gets he gets a bad rap. Um, do you agree that he gets a bad rap, kind of, on the I, at least on the left? I mean, I think to a certain extent, we're almost more talking about the enigma of his ghost, because certainly during his lifetime, he had certain alliances, enemies, rivalries, and a particular position within the political, literary scholastic framework um but he was operating as both a historian and sociologist writing his books but also a journalist appearing often in uh harper's magazine and the new york review of books i think he once i think there was one piece he did in the in the london review of books i read all those pieces many years ago but i didn't go back through them all um, <clears throat> when I was uh, writing this piece. So, but the way he kind of re returns constantly, and I, re I remember there was a phase, I guess it would be 20 years ago right now, when a lot of the, I had not encountered Lash when I was in college, in part because it was simply because I studied classics mostly and you know he didn't come up but um <clears throat> when i got to new york and sort of got involved in writing and editing and intellectual discourse you know he was being passed around uh i had a friend of mine who's now an editor in, working in london aspired to write his biography as it turned out someone else was doing that and did do that um uh, he, I mean, I, at the time we were reading him back then, it felt like what he was explaining was the aftermath of the 1960s, hmm. at least in the books from the culture of narcissism, the minimal self and the revolt of the elites. Obviously the true and only heaven has uh, a broader scope historically although it does also have the, the his autobiographical section at the beginning where he sort of places himself and his own political and intellectual development um <clears throat> and talk, discusses how he got into freud how he got into marx what was his reaction to the vietnam war and also his reaction to anti-communist politics generally a lot of that is in uh the agony of the american left which is a collection of his pieces from back then um and of course his sec his first book was on the reaction of american liberals to the russian revolution yep the second, book was, the second book was about the old populist radicals Left. The new, new American radicals, yeah, yeah, the new American radicals. Well, so. new new American radicalism, which actually Richard Hofstadter uh, made possible because he found that book, which was kind of an extension of his dissertation in a way. He found it like um, like lightning. Like the, he's like, wow, this is this is going to be popular, and it was. Mm -hmm. And 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 actually, uh, Lash uh, emerged in the early '60s as super. Uh, incisive and popular for grad students and um <clears throat> he was sort of uh that book itself shook up the whole like i don't know historian 
left wing mm -hmm. community. It, yeah. It made Lash a, um, it got him the gig with the New York Review of Books. Right. And he became a mini, a mini celebrity. Nothing, nothing at the level of what the culture of narcissism would do later. Right. And Which that, that brought him to the idea. White House and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, but. And that also, that book also became a touchstone for anybody writing about the post 60s generation selfishness in general uh <clears throat> yuppies for oh lack of sure. a better word but i think what people on the left maybe and this is kind of my going back to my i don't know my plea to to the left speaking here yeah. as a man a man of the left and i think you're a person obviously of the left you're writing in yeah. Jack, jacobin is that um um lash inserted himself in the socialist cause throughout the 60s and was very active in, yeah. in in that work and um and certainly in campus anti-war politics as well yeah i mean max eastman the great trotskyist max eastman mm -hmm. wrote a letter to lash after reading the new american uh, radicalism for which max eastman himself appeared in the book and mm -hmm. said even though you weren't a part of our movements back then you wrote as if you were like you you nailed it you you, you totally described exactly the the pitfalls of of our radicalism and the subtitle of the book was the intellectual as a social type which is mm -hmm. interesting because he's yeah. basically he's basically saying a a very profound criticism regarding the direction that american leftist intellectuals abandoned their own principles many of whom were former bolsheviks and yeah. basically sold out so Lash actually is perceived by the left, including people like Michael Harrington, to be firm in principles, even to the left of Harrington, who, again, is the founder of the of the, the, the DSA. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so Lash distinguishes himself as, uh, I don't know, a good leftist bona fides, let's say. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, um, uh which is in, which is interesting. I mean that that's, that's well, he, he he arrives, however, at kind of a convenient time in some ways because he was too young. I guess we should say, I mean, if he hadn't had an, suffered an early death from cancer, you know, how he would probably be in his eighties right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he mm -hmm. was John Updike's roommate at Harvard in freshman their freshman year in the 1940s mm -hmm. um so he was he did not experience the 1930s and so he did not experience the time the the basically anti-stalinist turn mm -hmm. that the rest of the left he did not experience the popular front and the anti-stalinist turn that the re rest of the left did at that time um, so he was able to write about the internecine squabbles of the left as they passed from the 30s into the 60s and up to the emergence of the new left, right? Exactly. Yeah. And he was criticized because, and this is a fair point of view, I mean, mm -hmm. he never took the new left seriously. Mm. And he rejected the centrality of student politics. He he saw it generally, generally saw it as, mm. as sometimes he would refer to it as infantile in extreme sense, but most often he would call student politics as importing a type of pseudo radicalism, which simply didn't mesh with the realities of American political power. And, and institutions yeah life, I think right? there's a, there's also a strain in his critique that um <clears throat> in a way the student left and the left of the late 60s because of the new um because of the the sim simply the gargantuan size of government and the and the rise of uh of mass media and television is that they were the the new left ended up being enthralled to the spectacle mm -hmm. right and so their uh 
their movement ended up being enthralled to a sort of theater that he found empty or absurdist and ineffective. Mm -hmm. And he also saw the real radicals like the Weathermen and uh, the Panthers, like following that logic to um, brutal ends that would result in their own death or imprisonment. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, that seemed, I, that seemed to fill him less. It seems those passages read to me to be written more in despair than in blame. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting point because I interviewed his daughter, who's also a historian mm-hmm. currently living called Elizabeth Lash Quinn, and yeah. she, she's an expert on American race history um and much more than that um but she emphasized that lash's marxism was consistent all the way throughout his work up even to the true and only heaven Mm -hmm. which which even there which is a book which we well people people judge as pro-populist or they judge Mm -hmm. as um, pro-petit bourgeoisie Pro petit bourgeoisie. Well, yeah. well, sure. But the interesting thing about that is that Lash had a fundamentally different understanding of kind of like what Marxism was in the mm-hmm. 19th century as a historian, yeah. Yeah. which was informed by E.P. Thompson and in, so-called English Marxism, right, as well as the Frankfurt School. So when yeah. when Lash will write his um, well-received book on the family. He's leaning on a Frankfurt School mode of analysis, Mm. right? Looking at the American family. And the Frankfurt School mode of analysis about the family is basically saying, wait a second, uh, mass consumer society is producing a fundamentally more alienated family. And we need to sort of recognize some liberatory aspects of the older bourgeois form of the family Mm -hmm. that are worth that are worth retaining. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, this is a pro. I think this is a problem, and in, uh, in your writings on Lash, uh, you get at it is is separating separating the Lash who is describing the present and the past from the Lash who is who might be said to be nostalgic for that past. I find him much more useful as a descriptive analyst then as i don't even think he thought of himself as being prescriptive when he was hailing values of bygone moments in american society i don't i don't think he could i don't think he he thought it was necessarily possible to return to a political economy where there was a much larger a class of freeholders is that mm-hmm. the right term and that uh, corporations and the state and the federal bureaucracy mm-hmm. were smaller and less powerful you might even throw in the heyday of labor unions in there too yeah which you no i think no i think that's right i mean i think lash Lash is hard for anybody on the left to debate because he's a damn good historian and yeah. he's done his homework and he brings his sources. So he can mm-hmm. say things like, okay, the Trotskyist um, proposal for revolutionizing society is not going to work in America after 1890, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, for example. And he'll give you complex reasons for why that's the case. But one of the things you see that's a consistent point for Lash for if you like Lash's socialism, I would say is one, it must be a, a certain very decentralized. And two, yeah. the demands of working class politics should not be centered on a rejection of, of work or, or a affirmation only of leisure time. Mm-hmm. And he says actually that Marx agrees with that. So yeah. the contemporary new left radicals And their importation of like Maoist ideas and things like that, where it's like a total rejection 
of labor, right? Mm. Or of, of, of the experience of work. He thinks, A, that's not what Marx was saying. And B, that's never going to resonate with the working class in America. Because yeah. what the working class in America wants is a better quality of work, right? And yeah. um, and and I think that 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 makes Lash some some could call a workerist socialist. But yeah, but I mean, I I was rereading certain passages of uh, the culture of narcissism today. Really put me in mind of David Graeber and his yeah. bullshit jobs thesis. Oh yeah, actually. Although I'm not sure, I'm not, well, I, I, I would be, I would have been interested to ask David what he thought about Lash. I would too. I mean, I think this is something that Elizabeth, his daughter, was huge on about how, you know, when Lash wrote a, wrote a book, he, he treated it as a craft and how his later yeah. turn to politics was all about this localist, um, sort of decentralized so so he's not an anarchist right but he's yeah. he's a decentralized um highly critical of bureaucracy um um so so therefore yeah the category of the petite bourgeois is going yeah. to be um someone who can offer a leg up for working class struggle it should not be seen as many Marxists see the the small business class or the petit bourgeois, at, which is a huge category in Marxism, almost incoherent in terms of a class yeah. category. Um, he's going to see them as actually being able to advocate for working class experience because they're in a contradictory class relation from the working class. They're kind of in between, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, I... I'll be honest, part of my attraction to Lash is a, is involved with my own self-understanding as a son of a, a owner-operator of a long-haul truck. Uh, so at once, I guess Paul Fussell would call my father high prole mm -hmm. um, in that he owned his own <coughs> rig. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was driving it, mm -hmm. you know, six days a week. So and then my own move into what by the time he's writing the revolt of the elites, uh, Lash is calling either the professional managerial class or after Robert Reich, the symbolic analysts. I mean, I'm just a working jobbing journalist, but um, I I, I I think I started reading Lash in my 20s to kind of try to understand uh, the changes that were going on within my own life and family to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, and it, how those and how those were tied up in the changes in the general American political economy and education system and class system. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, Lash himself is from a kind of rural Midwestern uh, family, which which has a lot of like a uh, craft workers and food yeah, was his people. father a newspaper man? And then his father eventually was a newspaper man. But even back yeah. before that, he comes yeah. from that kind of um, and even there was uh, political affiliations of rural left-wing populism that mm -hmm. he was, I think, from his grandparents. Um, but then his father was a newspaper man who, um, even Arthur Schlesinger, when the new radicalism came out, knew about his father because his father had some wide appeal in terms of readership. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, because Schlesinger appears in the new radicalism in a very negative light, and apparently he he wrote a scathing review of Lash and called him um, a smart aleck. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually interesting because his, so if you think about the trajectory all the way up to the posture. I mean, it, it makes sense. Lash was very harsh on Kennedy, who was He's very harsh on Kennedy. But, Ken, but, yeah. but but Lash went to Harvard. Kennedy went to Harvard. Yeah. Lash, is, Lash is a part of the elites from this, sure. you know, right? So hey, all, I went there, too. It all makes sense why yeah. he becomes a um, 
I don't know, a um, a gadfly, I think is the right term. He's a, a gadfly, gadfly and a lightning rod. And a lightning a rod. From, a Christopher Lash from gadfly to lightning rod in terms of, you know, gadfly during his life, lifetime, now lightning rod for our generation. Well, in yeah, terms I of mean, what you were talking about before. In 1968, right before Martin Luther King is assassinated, he and Barbara Ehrenreich, along with... Um, James Weinstein, the founder of In These Times magazine, and several mm -hmm. other left-wing uh, intellectuals, uh, yeah. uh, they all create this um, vision to to. Um, and by the way, they were all they were all critical of the new left and the student movement. Yeah, this is before Nixon gets reelected. This is before the Chicago convention. Right. Uh, uh, Lash is calling for a new socialist party. He's calling for a major socialist cultural revolution he's last working in iowa at that time he's in iowa it's before he goes to rochester so he's yeah. yeah he's there and and you know the chicago convention and nixon's re-election was a watershed moment at what at which point lash basically bows out and he's even invited to fancy uh literary events intellectual events and he turns them down and he's yeah. like, you know what? I'm I'm actually done with this. Yeah. Um, and that's where he starts his research that would develop into minimal self, culture of narcissism, mm -hmm. and that kind of. It's where it's where the American it's Frankfurt, to combine Freud and Marx, basically. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But that that interest had started ten years prior in the early sixties, yeah. but I think it becomes obviously, you know, uh, refined. Um, or to be, and, and also to become a critic of the society at large, more so than merely the left and its history and it's the, the old left and new left. Right? Yeah. I mean that he, he right. always, he always said he wanted to do what Raymond Williams did in culture and society, which is to develop an imminent theory of society mm. in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, working out of that kind of Frankfurt School English Marxist methodology, yeah, and and you know, I mean, it's just really important, I think, to to read Lash as a disaffected radical socialist, who, by the yes. way, in, in his correspondence with Michael Harrington, never. And I've had other people on my program about this as well. I don't know if you're aware of this. Harrington, Michael Harrington, wrote. Um, um, the other America, which was yeah, I, I, I've right? read it. Yeah, an expose on poverty, and he mm -hmm. became one of the foremost left wing thinkers, but a big socialist. I love his term for bohemian life, humorous poverty. <laughs> Do you remember that bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he he lived it too. He was uh, he yeah. Did that. So have I. So so uh, and yeah, I mean Harrington and Lash were were frenemies in in um the agony of the american left mm. he takes on harrington in a very scathing way and if you read it again this is mid 60s you will think to yourself gosh this is a critique of today's dsa because what is he saying he's saying there is no socialism with the democratic party i'm sorry but don't even go down that road and now look at us today, you know, after the squad and, you know, all of these kind of Biden and the post-Trump deal, it's like Lash has a point. Socialism may not be able, because Harrington had the notion of what is it called? Um, realignment, right? Yeah. The socialists can realign the Democratic Party somehow, which is a totally- A lot of, a lot of things were realigning at that time. There was a whole cadre of, you know, former Trotskyists, like, you know, post, like New York intellectual anti-Stalinists founding neoconservatism right at that time. And Harrington had, had had a lot of affiliations with those particular individuals around like Commentary Magazine, Partisan Review. Um, <clears throat> You know, they uh, they would go on to found the public interest, but though they, the original neocons were came out of that 
sector of the left. And remember, and they, they invited Lash to join them. And you know what he mm, said? He said, no, thank I, you. Yeah, he said, no. yeah, he wouldn't. Yeah, that's very that's again. I'm again, I'm trying to make my little case here <laughs> that Lash, yeah. Lash is is uh, a man of principles. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in, he, right. in no, no doubt about it. I mean, I get. I guess the 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 thing that um, the way that the that today, uh, you know, people on the right and mostly intellectuals, but also I guess Steve Bannon, they're interested in Lash because he provides a <clears throat> penetrating critique of liberalism. Mm -hmm. Right. So they feel like they've found someone with a mutual enemy. Right. That doesn't mean that uh, Lash would ha have any truck with their tax cuts or right. many other of their uh, society degrading uh, political policies. No, it's true. I mean, his. If we fast forward to the true and only heaven, which I think is mm. probably his most sustained sort of critique of liberalism, it mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he he makes a really convincing historical argument for the the vapid foundation of progressivism in capitalism, and mm -hmm. and and he shows that it's sort of a a um um it breeds its own kind of nihilistic um, cult in a sense. And that, and that it, it creates, it, it hollows out um, the possibility of community. And so, yeah, he's going to end up kind of like um, McIntyre, the Marxist thinker McIntyre for virtue, family, community, mm -hmm. this kind of, I wouldn't call it traditional, tradition or pro-tradition in the way right. that you consider that but it's something like an acknowledgement um that capital well i think i think in part he he values those things because the their hollowing out has led to a lot of the uh a lot of the deleterious symptoms that he sees in on the contemporary scene in the from the 70s onward and in i mean your chapter on lash uh i mean it's a, in psychoanalytic terms it would be it's kind of the transformation or disintegration of the superego right right um and so Again, it's a matter of the the marketization and liberalization and the changing political economy having effects and capitalism itself having effects on family structure and social relations that are that are happening irrespective of left and right political views on the matter which you could say family values on the right and abolition of the family on the left. Like independent of what each side is advocating, these things are happening anywhere, right? Uh, and so he, he is describing these changes and the, their effects and the consequences of those effects. It seems to right. Me. And no, that's, think, that's why he's useful to me. I, you know, I'm not um, a family man. I don't particularly yearn for those social structures. Um, you know, I'm not nostalgic for any kind of, I don't know, frontier masculinity or whatever these people are talking about. That's fair. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I don't. I, 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 I feel like there are, there's, whole there are like you know there's a passage in the true and only heaven where he talks about petite bourgeois values and like you know he's right that some of them are good even as he admits that they come they often not always but often come along with 
bigotry, chauvinism, what have you, all this, all the sort of things one likes to bemoan, xenophobia, all the things that one bemoans about Trumpism. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much right there. Uh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a, it's funny, I, in my Jacobin piece, I, I happened to be rereading White Noise at the same time I was rereading Culture of Narcissism. There's a character, and White Noise is all, all, all about, um, you know, liberal college professors. All the characters, except for the children, pretty much are those sorts of characters. And there's a there's a cultural studies professor, his specialty is Elvis studies, named Murray J. Siskind, who says to the narrator, Jack Gladney, who's a professor of Hitler studies, have you ever noticed that any handyman you hire is always a bigot? Mm. <laughs> and to me, this, this was totally the sort of like liberal condescension that Lash writes about in The Revolt of the Elites. And there's a chapter in what there's a chapter in the true and only heaven where he's uh writing about i think it's a forum in the nation about the state of american society and entry after entry is imbued with kind of uh east coast liberal condescension toward the heartland and it just made me think that we are I, I, every, anytime, whether I'm going back through kind of these, you know, granular political studies, or if I'm reading Leslie Fiedler on American literature, it seems like we are in an endless regress of the same yeah. literary, political, and intellectual arguments. Yeah, and patterns of acting them out. I think that's. I think that's true. I think that's a testament to Lash's. Um, surviving relevance that he's yeah. able to, that he's able to say that there there exists a kind of fictitious quality of the natural way american politics form formulates its idea of an enemy right mm. or, or of otherness right yeah and i feel that the trump moment kind of in a paradoxical way actually shook that up which is why uh -huh. which is why maybe this is actually something in the long term that will be good about Trump because it became an assault ultimately on the coherence because liber liberals kind of need that fake enemy in, in reality, yeah. right? They, they don't. Well, they, they I mean, it, it, it was very, con it, I mean, what in a way, no, in a way their ideal scenario is like, I don't know acquiescing to the supreme court giving george w bush the presidency and then loyally going to war with him while posing as slightly oppositional i mean i it seemed to me the democratic party was it, we were i mean the you know the third way it was like clinton became reagan and then bush became clinton and you know obama was another reagan and that the, you know, as long as they had the very near enemy in the neoconservative Republicans, they never had to deal with any demands from the left. You right. Know, then, I guess I'm straying from Lash into just part, party politics here, but I think, I think his analysis over the years does this is why we come back to him ultimately because it helps us understand the uh i don't know in, in, you could say that like trump it, it might have been the best thing that ever happened to the democratic party and he may have made them the default party of government for the rest of our lives partly just by putting so many right wingers on the supreme court you know yeah 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 i mean this is the debate i've had with some socialists who think it's a debate about has trump bolstered and strengthened democratic establishment or has he weakened it i think he has weakened the ideological coherence of liberalism but he's strengthened the democratic party in the process yeah and so That's so therefore same. therefore so aaron Re aaron reich and lash in the late 60s were correct to say to the new left, like actually, um, it's great to like 
burn down buildings and like protest and do the radical stuff. But like, we need to create a working class party, a socialist party mm -hmm. that's going to actually provide a true alternative, not in some kind of Ralph Nader Green Party, but like a real yeah. socialist, different, you know, and that's part of the reason also why Lash is appealing, I think, because, um, you, but there is a danger with, with latching onto Lash too literally because you then end up discarding the entirety of the left and saying, well, they're mm -hmm. all kind of phonies, right? Or they're all yeah. stooges for the Democrats when, yeah. when we both know that's not fair and that's not like, you know, we need solidarity and like, you know, stuff like that. So, so there is a certain sense in which people can become too lashianized, maybe too. I don't know if you agree with that or. Well, I mean, intellectually, I agree with it. Personally, I see myself as more an atomized, uh, you know, and I, I, I despair of any of my own political efficacy, shall we say, you know, oh, that's, that's actually, um, that's actually maybe an interesting pivot to but how old are, how old are you? 42. I just turned okay, 42. I'm 46. So okay. my sort of defining moment of my youth was casting a vote for Nader in 2000. So you are a Gen Xer then? Yeah. You are a Gen Xer. Okay. Very much well, so. Well, hey, I mean, there's there's a good thing about you, which is at least you're a, so, you're a left wing Gen Xer. Most Gen oh, Xers yeah, are totally. not left. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to do any kind of greenwald shuffle or whatever you might be suggesting i have watched friends um you know waltz on over to the other side and it's um makes me sad but well, yeah, yeah this, I is, could... this is something i wanted to to raise with you so just for the benefit of people listening to this yeah. um Christian is a part of a, well, he's, he's a actor for, um, plays in Manhattan, yeah. which, which have been covered by places like New York times and they, they're, they're well-attended plays. The playwright is Matthew Gazda. The name of the play is Times Square. I, mm -hmm. I frankly don't know much about this. Um, I find it really really cool and interesting what was so f weird about the new york times writing about your movement or whatever is the fact that they sort of tried to claim tried to say that the this group that you're affiliated with is pro-tradition pro-catholic tends to be conservative i think they even said that people wear trump hats i, I i've never seen that yeah and certainly not in the play i mean like party politics doesn't come up in the plays i think one character whines about getting canceled or something he's a musician um i the the play that play is about uh careerist rivalry among writers one of whom is a sellout uh who's written a novel that's been sold to netflix and the other whom is like a filmmaker who is uh, kind of model like a millennial Terrence Malick, let's say. And then <clears throat> my character is kind of a grumpy, older, uh, bon vivant novelist who's a mentor to them and considers one of them a sellout and one of them uh, true to uh, their shared literary ideals. There are other little notes where you know it's all about people kind of um partying late at night and certain of the uh, the non-principal characters will, will say things like i'm getting into catholicism lately they're basically just matt in that play in a lot of his dialogue is just channeling online discourse and trying to critique it and so because a lot of that discourse and a lot of what he's doing is just satire, right? So um, 
I don't know. None of these people, as far as I could tell, go to church very much. Yeah. Of these like new Catholic, like hipster people. It's to me, I'm down there all the time. It seems to me a fiction in these bars. It's just like art people, media people drinking as they have been as long as New York City has existed and uh, smoking less because Bloomberg outlawed it. Say, I, I guess that what I'm saying is the Dime Square culture war, as it's been depicted, is largely a fiction. There is, I would say there's a, an exception to that in that, you know, some, some podcasters who are disaffected with the Democratic Party and and disappointed about Sanders and make their money or you know spend their time just talking and are really funny go so far will sometimes go so far as to be so anti centrist Democrat that to some people it sounds like they're right wing, but I don't really take money. I don't, I don't know. I don't t like, I, we're living in a time of too much discourse. Mm. You know what I mean? And mm. people are trying to say things. People say so much that they end up saying things they don't even mean. And with that, I'm going to stop talking about this. Okay, cool. So one, one other question about it, if I may. Yeah. Um, sure. I know you, so another thing about you for listeners is that you, you're a reader and yeah, Christian, yeah you, you, you're, you're a prolific book review writer and you have a nice, um, sub stack that churns out review upon review. Upon yeah. Review. I've been leaning. I, I just finished a big piece for Harper's. It's co the cover of the next issue. It's about the Penguin Random House merger trial. Yeah. And uh, so I've been leaning on my Substack on archival pieces, but I've got some new new material that's going to be coming soon. Do you think that like other American moments in history, given some of your reading of history and American culture, mm -hmm. um, were composed politically speaking mm -hmm. in ways that were similar to this dime square moment or do you see this as kind of like you know i guess like prior literary bohemias uh, yeah. tended to be left-wing mostly right yeah or or well i mean or kind of well, kind unless of like, you count ezra pound and t.s Eliot. you know i mean yeah, i guess that's a good point i guess you know they both went over to london and certainly I mean, the, there was a, the modernists were politically heterogeneous, right? William Carlos Williams was, you know, right, was no fascist or right winger and was writing letters to Ezra Pound till the end of his life, scolding him for his anti-Semitism and his fascist sympathies and activities. Um, I also, you know, study of the history of Russia and the Soviet Union will leave you despairing at the irrelevance, the political irrelevance of American literature relative to the way the, the, the force of poetry and novel writing <clears throat> in Moscow and St. Petersburg and the and the real political radicalism of all stripes, you know, uh, socialist and reactionary among literary circles in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, it may be, I mean, it might it might be a different story simply if Washington, D.C. and New York City were the same city, you mm -hmm. know? Like, mm -hmm. if I spent the, the I spent the, um, 
month of August in Washington, D.C., and just people down there don't read. Right. They wear, worry about, like, they worry about, like, appropriations bills, you know? Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, I'm thinking here of Russell Jacoby's death of the public intellectual history. He's got apparently got a big piece in the next issue of Harper's 2 about why the insufficient response of the left to the attack on Salman Rushdie last August. I'm told. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. But yeah, he's he's back. No, I mean, you're right. I mean, if we were to go back to, and this is a nice kind of dovetail to how Lash might be read concurrent to other writers of his generation, which I want to get your take on. But, yeah. you know, at the time, like Allen Ginsberg and Norman Mailer and William S. Burroughs and like, you know, there were public intellectual literary figures that had some, I don't know, moral conscience. Uh, uh -huh. we, well, you know, Mailer, you know, Barbary Shore is Mailer's great Trotskyist novel. Um, after that, An American Dream is this kind of Kennedy as psycho novel. Uh, then he goes into explicitly political writings about from the 1960 convention onward. He's usually writing about the conventions and the campaign trail and the candidates. And I don't know. I mean, at certain points, he calls himself a left conservative. Mm. And to a certain extent, you know, uh, I, I mean, in, in some, I mean, people like that kind of combination. Uh, like I'm on the left, but I'm a small C conservative. I think even like Lewis Lapham, the old editor of Harper's would sometimes say that about himself, maybe even on television. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how useful it is, especially with someone as with figures as idiosyncratic as Mailer and Lash. You know, you could right. apply that label to both of them in some right. ways, but it, they wouldn't end up being in the same political category in any meaningful sense. Yeah, but do um, we do we see? Who do you say, if you look out today, might get close to having a kind of public intellectual, from a literary point of view in particular, yeah. um, I don't know, stake on the political conversation that we're having? And I don't even know how you might judge that, perhaps on book sales, as well as on like, I don't know. Well, I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the literary sphere, you have, I mean... The kind of like a, people don't quite realize it, but a big political generation of novelists has just kind of left the scene. I'm thinking of like Robert Stone, Peter Matheson, um, and a very interesting figure in terms of literature and politics is Marilyn Robinson, but in some ways, um, I think she came to see, even though she had spent a lot of time in the British library studying Marx and also was very interested in, um, you know, mainline Protestant liberalism in the Midwest came to just kind of idealize Obama to the extent that they were interviewing each other in the pages of the New York real books, right? <laughs> so ultimately, I mean, I have often said that almost all American fiction writers, I mean, very few of, there are very few of them that you, that if their politics ended up being expressed, wouldn't be called um, pretty much complacent centrist liberals more or hmm. less complacent i mean some of them are probably really gung-ho on certain issues hmm. like if you certainly from gen x and older i think that's the case hmm. like the younger generation there's probably we haven't really seen our, the raft of um i expected there to be a raft of novels that represented 
the Occupy movement at least. And so far I can only really think of two prominent or very good ones. One um, is called Overthrow by Caleb Crane, who's a little bit older than I am, uh, comes out of the sort of N plus one intellectual circle. Uh, and another one is called the very, is, they're both pretty idiosyncratic novels in that they have one involves uh, telep the overthrow has telepathy in it. Uh, the visitors by Jesse Uzevska Stevens is the other book I'm thinking of. And she's younger. She's a, a kind of a prime millennial um, that has magic realist elements to it. Uh, but you know, they're both very interested in that protest moment. And you see far more, you know, when oftentimes when American novelists write political novels, they go back to the last moment of radicalism and historicize it, as in a book like uh, the flamethrowers by oh, Rachel Kushner. Kushner. Kushner yeah, 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 yeah. Would you wrote or, uh, you wrote a review of that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, she's she's a good. I, example I, I, I didn't like that novel mostly on aesthetic grounds. Politically, politically, the ideas in it are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's like, I don't, when a novelist is writing a historical novel about earlier political moments, usually there, usually you get either some mixture of disappointment that this radical moment didn't come to fruition, or you have the present congratulating itself for not being as bad as the past was, right? Because, you know, we abolished slavery you know, we're more and more progressive. We're good liberals now, not like in the bad old days, you know. Hmm. Um, and Kushner's falls into what category there? Sorry. Well, I think she's, I think there's, her book has an excitement and perhaps a disappointment and a nostalgia for that radical moment. Yeah. There's also, she also draws a line between, between uh, the futurists, which are right-leaning Italians and left-leaning like land artists in the New York in the 1970s. Um, there's literally a character who's the son of an industrialist from that Italian milieu who's working as a sculptor in New York City. Um, so in her case it's pretty complicated but there is there's a one of the reasons why i mean it's very common for novelists to go back and write a historical novel about the era when they were children or they you know just before their own birth you know because mm -hmm. you're curious about what your parents lives were like back mm -hmm. then or what the mm -hmm. world was like before you were in it Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to be disparaging when <clears throat> uh, there's, and there's lots, lots of, you know, uh, Christopher Sorrentino has written a good, I think it's called Trance. That's about Patty Hearst and the um, SLA. Uh, Dana Spiota has a kind of a Weatherman book called Eat the Document. Um, a lot of American novelists have done in, uh, interesting work returning to that phase of time, as have American filmmakers, I think, like Paul Schrader's Patty Hearst movie is great. It's from the mid 80s. And then some of the, then in terms of the, I mean, then you have like, I don't know. Is there a politics to Cormac McCarthy? I just reviewed his books and I couldn't really tell you. He more thinks of things in terms of like cosmic good and evil and the bomb as kind of like an evolutionary force that that 
emerged through man in, in, as he was fighting for his own survival with his fellow men, right? <laughs> Not, I, I couldn't tell you about the, his, his politics from those books. Uh, Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo. Um, you know, DeLillo, I think, you know, he thinks a lot about the left. He's identified, they're both identified as sort of paranoid novelists. They both come out of the 60s. Um, they're probably, I don't know, they probably pull the lever for Democrats, but are like skeptical of them in their own way. Um, to me, one of the most politically interesting and interesting all around novelists of the moment is Percival Everett. I haven't read his new book, Dr. No, uh, but his, his uh, last book, The Trees, was a, a kind of, I, I was scolded for saying this, but frankly, a kind of Tarantino-esque revenge fantasy about um, uh, a sort of secret group that went around uh, co committing revenge murders against the the against lynchers and their descendants. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And it's a comedy too. Sounds very Tarantino. Dark one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, to go back to Lash, um, uh -huh. I thought it might be interesting for, for folks to gain your perspective, given your, I guess your expertise um, in liter in all things literary. Can you help us understand Lash in relationship to the, predominant American novelists and writers of his time, and maybe well, how, how some of those writers are similar to Lash in terms of Lash's own views on culture and society. Or, uh, or different. It did, rereading DeLillo, it seemed to me he had probably read Lash. They had a very similar view of that emergent yuppie or pmc or symbolic analysts or you know campus radical or or kind of uh the new class uh, yeah yeah the new class um then you know it's interesting to think about updike and lash together because updike is famously called a narcissist by David Foster Wallace, as was Philip Roth and Mailer. And certainly you think they that's exhibit a lot of the symptom, uh, they all exhibit a lot of the symptoms that Lash was diagnosing. And sometimes he just comes right out and says it about their characters. Uh, Joseph see. Heller, in, in particularly his second novel, Something Happened is a book that a lash returns to repeatedly in the culture of narcissism um to because it's narrate and i've never read that novel i've long been meaning to its narrator seems to be living out the uh ironized and careerist life um <clears throat> that uh I mean, culture of narcissism is largely, to me, it seems to be largely about, like, and minimal self are largely about the deformation of personality and and the ways to survive within a this new bureaucratized and corporate culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he literally says that he's he's kind of you'd think that he. It sounds like he's he has a more scolding tone in the culture of narcissism, but in minimal self, it becomes clear that the people he's describing can't help but behave this way. Mm. You know, they're not just he's not scolding them for being selfish. They can be no other way because there's nothing else for them to serve. Um, one of Lash's literary hobby horses that I don't agree with is his uh, bemoaning, his general bemoaning of postmodernism in literature, as exemplified by John Barth, 
Donald Barthelme, Bertolt Brecht, Samuel Beckett. I and Pynchon too. No. That, what? And Pynchon too. No. Yeah, Pynchon probably comes up in there. Although I wouldn't put Pynchon quite in the same category because, well, I know he's Pynchon is certainly hyper self conscious, right? This hyper self consciousness that Lash is um, despairing about. Lawrence Stern in the 18th century and many other writers back then were just as it what that that is a signet a cyclical um characteristic of literature that it seems to me has been you know i'm a classicist there were ancient authors who were just you know you could aristophanes you know it's often the comedians who are working those kind of like self-conscious games and that strain is always present in literature. It's just more, uh, we pay more attention to it at some times than we do at others. I think that's fair. And there's actually a book called The Heresy of Self-Love by Paul Zwieg, I think is how you say uh -huh. his name. I'm reading it right now. But he says in the preface to the book that because of what it is, it's a history of of this kind of like you say the cycles of narcissism and culture yeah going back to like the gnostic heresy up through roman times up through mm -hmm. you know up to the that modern and fascinating it is fascinating the heresy the, of self-love yeah and in the preface he calls out lash huh. and says that lash is a sort of one of many intellectuals who are trying to disparage um the something that should be understood actually as a subversive sign of the success of the counterculture because as you know one of the things that lash does disparage in his midwestern socialist way yeah is, is the counterculture yeah right? so well yeah it's it, it, yeah. it, it, in in literary matters he seems to think that like 19th century realism is a foundation from which you can only stray and he has that in common with many a literary critic too but yeah i'm thinking uh, of like um of like a lukach in his theory of the novel mm, is kind of yeah. the same thing yeah so but you're not you're not of that camp so can you can you say more about why you don't like that idea or, or what you're well i i simply i simply don't think that it uh Lash takes it as a sign of deterioration and an emptying out of reality. And whereas I see it as like a, a permanent characteristic of literature that is expressed different ways at different times. And therefore, I mean, I am not, I suppose you could probably, or, you know, a modern Lukács, I should look into it and see if anybody's done this. You could, it could be argued that, you know, uh, that kind of literature is decadent and, and signals a waning of empire. You know, that might, a, 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 a historian, with real historical fire, a literary historian with real historical firepower might be able to make a convincing argument along those lines. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I tend to think that the concept of generations is useful in this, in a literary sense, not in the, often people rightly dismiss talk of generations as like, a, you know, an advertising construct or something. But, you know, I'm just talking about people who are reading the same things when they were growing up and maturing and then writing at the same time, at the same yeah. stage in their lives. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so. I think that's these, fair. But I mean, these wax and wane. I think, I think that's generations. fair. I think that's fair. But I mean, if you go back to your example of Cormac McCarthy, yeah, you, you and I both could not say as kids like people of the left, right? 
we could right. not say that Cormac McCarthy is a reactionary because he reduces his vision of social antagonisms to these kind mm. of, dark, I don't know, cosmic, elemental, quasi elemental, Darwinistic. Yeah. I mean, that is, um, that, that could be construed for someone like Lukács as a sign of, of, of a type of incoherence. Because again, for Lukács, everything is about the novelist's relationship to an understanding of the totality of the system of society. And it's like, a, it would not be unfair to call the most recent novels by Cormac McCarthy, a little bit incoherent. <laughs> have you, yeah. have you read them? Uh, uh, no, it's, I mean, they're, they're really yeah. fascinating books, but in terms of genre and intellectually, uh, you know, I struggled to, trace a coherent line through them but that's neither here nor there i mean i trying to think of a, a you know what do you make of like someone like nosgard or something like the my struggle series what do you nosgard is like a is a nosgard is a social democrat liberal from oslo or not from oslo from norway who lives between uh stockholm and london and you know is nostalgic for a romantic heroic past but politically he's interested in you know a well-functioning eu and humane treatment of migrants like any good european social democrat liberal i mean i've interviewed him on this matter mm. that's what, literally what he'll talk about when you talk about politics mm. Mm. he's no rev no revolutionary no no he's he no and it's not well the thing you don't really need a revolution in norway right right you need to you need to make sure that nazis don't come back Mm -hmm. <laughs> right because you don't you need fewer Anders Breiviks because <laughs> I, I visited Norway in uh September mm -hmm. it is really nice mm -hmm. they have a lot of stuff figured out and they have all that money from oil mm -hmm. so you know they can spread it around mm -hmm. so really I mean, yeah, if I don't, I don't, is there a left? I, I, I'm not aware of a left in Norway that's agitating for a revolution outside of a party system, but I don't right, know very much about their politics. I mean, yeah, we're, we're like, we're in like America, right? We're like, if, if, yeah. you, if you take Bernie Sanders and you bring him to Norway, he's kind of like a centrist. And yeah, so like totally. In America, to be for Bernie Sanders is to be a revolutionary. In a, in a, not really, but well, what you're looking for is a political revolution that takes over the Democratic Party, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, those centrists, man. Have you ever been to the DNC? <laughs> you mean like? I mean, convention? have you? You mean you mean like their convention and like done party politics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to the 2012 convention and the 2016 convention for the LRB. Like those oh, like wow. centrist Democrats are fucking they are fucking powerful. I know. Like, I know. Like uh, well, going back to like the the question of this new fascism or whatever and like I some Book I didn't use editor. that word. I didn't use that word, by the way, but go on. Okay, what, what, whatever. Some book review editor asked me to review the, the book by Bronze Age Pervert, Bronze Age Mindset, <laughs> yeah. right? So I wrote it and, you know, I, I didn't even find it funny, which is the thing that people who like it but don't agree with it. I don't know. I thought it was just kind of stupid, right? But... One you didn't of find it dangerous. You didn't find it dangerous. No, I didn't find it dangerous. I found it stupid and kind of like stupid and pointless. And its political prescriptions at the end are like men need to 
make stronger friendship bonds with other men and that we should start the boy scouts again and it's like dude go down to washington dc and all these democrat dudes were on the lacrosse team and you know rowing and running and playing sports in high school at rich fancy liberal high schools and then in the ivy league and like you know i lived through this i know the ones who went down to like become lawyers and take over washington dc and they have a lot of money they actually know what they're doing which is not to say they run the country in the right way or the way i think it should be run but they like so the bronze age pervert calls these these like basically centrist creatures bug men and that seems to me a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the very powerful forces in it that like simply the very powerful people who control the democratic party like the clintons and barack obama and even joe biden are extremely effective politicians and managers and you know they they were feckless in the face of George Bush and Karl Rove somehow, but they underestimating them is foolish. Like they know how to like look at the way that they just all got them all to fall in line behind Biden when it seemed like Sanders was going to beat him in 2020. You yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, they just pulled the levers and it happened. No, I mean, you're right. You're right. But I mean, I think the going back to the there is there is there's competency and you're right that there's a lack that that it's a total fantasy that um, that they are fomenting the crisis of masculinity. That's a total total. Oh, yeah, that's that's just absolutely it's a paranoid hallucination. Yeah, it's it's no, no, there's no crisis of masculinity there. Yeah. The audience for that Bronze Age pervert book is a bunch of alienated young men who spend too much time playing video games. <laughs> as far as I can tell. <laughs> I mean, I say that as something of a Gen X chauvinist. I think video games are just a silly, pointless activity. And my mother never let me have a Nintendo. <laughs> but uh, it seemed to me that, you know, that book is written by and for you know, alienated young men who are, I don't know, ultimately harmless and not worth thinking about. Yeah. Whereas one thing, one thing like Bronze Age Pervert says about, he barely mentions Obama, but he says he's a pure product of like the intelligence state. And I'm mm. like, yeah, he is. And he's a good one too, you know? Like, well, I, I, I slightly agree. And intelligence, also, I mean, the corporate, you know, essentially the military industrial corporate complex, you know. But but at the same time, I think there's a certain hollowness of the ideological platform that that Obama used to used to call forth and call and, and could command. And that, well, that, that's gone now. Obama, Obama. The the problem is that like because the Democratic Party is actually, you know, obviously it's a coalition, right? And they have like various factions that they're bringing together to, you know, make it work. And fundamentally, their problem is that the way they talk to voters always is one version one version or another of platitudes, right? So only a very talented politician like Obama or Bill Clinton can sell those platitudes because they are platitudes. Biden, it was all platitudes all the time. Michelle Obama is good at, it has, a, has a, an effective political style because she fuses it with the language of therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, Hillary Clinton fails because 
out of her mouth, it comes out as pure baby boomer self-satisfaction. Yep, that's right. No, I, I think I think you're right. But I still insist that like centrism is a paradoxical to the extent that it has a certain power, it doesn't it doesn't have the same attraction or it doesn't have the same natural allure. Oh, I don't that, think it nec- I don't think it has the allure to voters and to the American population that it doesn't deserve any A. Right. Uh and it doesn't it no longer has that attraction if it ever did, or the way that Obama and Clinton were able to command it. And ultimately they didn't deserve it for the way they acted in office. Governed, right. You could argue that Biden has been a better, you know, governing better than either of them. But uh I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, those people are in control and they're good at being in control and only like like only some kind of weird combination of of deep antipathy to them within the population expressed towards Hillary Clinton and embodied in Donald Trump made them lose that particular election. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you know, like I said, I come from the era of Nader, Gore and Bush when we were despairing that it was, you know, Democrats and Republicans were too, you know, you know, the same party. Yeah, you also come from the era of like, yeah, of of I mean, Occupy was kind of a Gen X thing. It was an ad busters. The whole the whole idea was very Gen X. Strangely, I was living in England at that time, so I went to Occupy St. Paul's at some point, but I was not in New York City. Well, yeah, I mean, it was it was it was promising. It felt mm-hmm. global because the movement of the squares and what was going on in Egypt, and you know. Yeah. It had a certain, um, it was kind of the end of the anti-globalization period. Um, it, right. Well, the le- yeah, a, a movement into a different moment for the left. And you know, my insight, my intel has informed me that Bernie is planning to run again in 2024. Wow. Yeah. So that's we gotta, great. Got to prepare for that, for God's yeah. sake. I don't, I don't know what that's going to be like, but. Well, I just want to thank you for joining me for a very interesting conversation on Lash, which veered off into very cool little tangents on literature. I Hopefully, people got some good book recommendations listening to Christian pontificate. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Mike Crumpler, who used to be uh-huh. a, co- a co-host of this here. This oh, here. really? Yeah. No, I saw him, I saw him last week. He is a, a big fan of Christian Lorenzen, so he <laughs> um, he'll be probably happy that we had this conversation. Um, even though I don't know if he likes Lash, but that's neither here nor there. Right, right. But um, but yeah, man. Thanks again for coming on the program. And uh, hey, it's been fun. Let's do now it again. To, some point. Have, my next task is I have to go finish rereading "Making It" by Norman Podoritz. Okay. Is, yeah. Is this a when did that come out? 67, I think. He's an interesting cat. He's the former Trotsky neocon guy, right? Yeah. And I'm writing well, he was it's hard to say he was even that he was he was he came along too late to be one of those real trots like Irving Crystal or Daniel Bell. He was like he was basically just a careerist. And at first being a careerist meant being a commentary liberal who, you know, went to parties with the partisan review crowd and, and tagged along with Norman Mailer. Mm. And then after, after making it came out and they all turned on him for, for saying it out loud, saying the careerism out loud, he saw that, the he had a phase of severe alcoholism and then emerged still the editor of commentary and led the proper neocons over to the right where they could enjoy 
power and audiences at the White House mm -hmm. by the 1980s. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've been a huge, I'm a huge student of the history of Trotskyism in America. Obviously, people have mostly, if you haven't seen Reds by Warren Beatty, I recommend it. I'm in but, fact about to write a piece on that for a new film magazine called Gallery. Yeah, it's such a good it's a movie. Great movie. It's such yeah. a great movie. Yeah. And you know, um, the thing that people should realize is that those those American socialist guys like Reed and Max Eastman, um, uh, and what's his name? The playwright, uh, uh Eugene O'Neill, played Eugene by Jack. O'Neill. Those guys traveled to Russia, like they met with Lenin, they met with Trotsky, Max Eastman uh, published Lenin's Testament for the first time the world had seen it in the mm -hmm. New York Times, mm -hmm. which was the document that Stalin tried to conceal to the public because in it, it's like his deathbed wishes. Yeah. Uh, Lenin says, I don't want Stalin to lead. Right. And he kind of suggests yeah. I want, he kind of says, I want Trotsky more so. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so those, those, those are not some kind of fly by the seat of your pants, American Johnny come lately's. No, yeah, they I, were real, real they were guys. Engaged. They were, they were yeah. part of, they were part of the, of the Bolshevik revolution. And, and, um, and they tried to import Bolshevism to the U S mm -hmm. and that kind of going and, back uh, to last. And, and Lash, and it, Lash shows, I mean, it, Lash shows in his early book that 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 all fell apart. Like that, that's what his book, The New Radicalism, partly was about. So. Well, that first book uh, about liberals' reaction to the Russian Revolution, I I only read the opening couple chapters, but he says it's different from his second book because he says people ask me why I didn't why I only wrote about liberals. And he said, in America, you can't be anything but a liberal, which struck me as, um, uh, well, it's just, that seems to be the, I would have believed that during the Bush administration, essentially, that you couldn't be in America, you couldn't, really hold or express any views, at least not in a major publication that didn't align or fall within the neoliberal consensus fear. And that seems to be what's been changing both for good and ill since the 2016 election. I hope you're right. I mean, this yeah. is the, yeah, this is, yeah. I mean, let's, let's pray that you're right about that. I mean, that, that's the whole, Louise Hart's American exceptional mm -hmm. argument that there's kind of like material reasons why socialism has never taken off in America. Yeah. And, um, uh, any the any vital true, center as Arthur Schlesinger would have. Yeah. Any true leftist just you kind of you kind of have to reject that thesis because yeah. it becomes a kind of a self-fulfilling a fait a fait accompli. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in my in my that. case, I would I would I wouldn't say, I just, w I guess what I would say is that um, up until recently, the, the center was so effective at maintaining a hold on both government and prominent media outlets such as the television networks and the New Yorker magazine and the New York Times that uh, it wasn't so much the ideological nature of the American public as it's the strength of those institutions mm. and the people who are in charge of them. And to a certain extent, you know, generational change and technological change have uh, eroded that power base. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Anyway, it's anyway, been a lot of fun talking about all this. It's been great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna press stop and um, okay. hold on hold on one sec. I'll just say goodbye to you. Thanks thanks all everybody right. for listening though.